So, uh, so I'm going to tell you, um, uh, give you some thoughts about open science today and why, uh, why it's a good idea. I think uh, if you're at this meeting, you probably already think it's a good idea. But maybe, maybe I'll be able to uh, mention some things that you don't know about or haven't heard about and help you uh, uh, when, next time you're discussing it with someone else and trying to convince them, someone who's not such an advocate, uh, why they should be more open in the way they do their science. So, so first, let me say a little bit about um, what, what I mean when I say open science. There's various things you can think about uh, in this domain. Um, it's, uh, this, this particular um, conference is about open software mostly, but I, I'm going to talk about three categories of open software, or of open science rather. One is, is free and open source software, uh, and I'll start with that. And I'm also going to talk about open data, which is somewhat different. Uh, and other issues come up. And then last, I'll talk about uh, open access publishing. So those are all part of open science, of sharing the, sharing the work that we do. And let me just sort of say also as an overview that um, uh, if you're a scientist, and I assume that almost all, if not all of you are, um, one thing that we do in science is that we, uh, we share our work. We tell other people about our work. Everybody in science wants, to, uh, wants other people to know about their work. We do that, generally speaking, by, um, by publishing it and occasionally giving talks at conferences. Um, so in a way, if you're not in favor of doing science in the open, um, I would ask, well, what exactly are you, are you doing then? Because if you're doing your science in secret, then uh, it's not really uh, doing, uh, doing really anybody any good. So why would you do that? So let me talk about open software first, um, which, uh, which I'm sure all of you are involved with some open software projects if you're at this meeting. So um, I've, been, I've been releasing my software as open source software for a long time, um, starting back in the late 90s with a program called Glimmer. Um, Glimmer is a program for bacterial gene finding uh, that we developed uh, when I first went to, uh, when I first started working with people at uh, the Institute for Genomic Research, or TIGER. Um, many of you have probably heard of TIGER. It's, it's not with us anymore. But uh, in 2006, it got renamed the J. Craig Venture Institute. So the thing called the Venture Institute is what um, Tiger was. Um, it's a little different now. Uh, but I was, I was at Tiger for a number of years. And we were, in the late 90s and early 2000s, the world's leading center for microbial genome sequencing. And when I first went there, there wasn't much software for, do, for doing gene finding in bacteria. And so I built this system with some of my colleagues, particularly Art Delcher, um, who's still a member of my group even now. Um, and, uh, and they're the, the papers we published on it over the years. Um, and it, an interesting anecdote about this was that, that so Tiger had, um, had a lawyer, like uh, any uh, good uh, institution has these, these in, in the U.S. And um, the, the sort of model back in the 90s for, for software in the research world, uh, and still the model in many fields, uh, less so in genomics and bioinformatics, was that you tried to make money on it if you could, even if you got public funding to develop it. And uh, some of us in the community were coming to the realization back then that maybe that's not such a good thing. Um, everybody wants to make money, so um, you have to kind of re repress that feeling a little bit. Um, but you should also realize that in the research world, most software doesn't yield any money. So everybody wants to win the lottery and thinks, oh, my software package is going to be something that you know, Microsoft will license and I'll make millions of dollars on. But uh, that very rarely happens. Uh, much, what's much more likely is if your software is successful in the research community, you can get funding uh, from, in the U.S. from the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health or other funding agencies to continue working on it. So what you really want is for people to use your software and to reference it, and you want it to be scientifically successful. And so we realized this among the scientists in, in, at Tiger. We realized this. And then we had um, our lawyer, though, he didn't really see it that way. Um, so, um, so what we did was we went over his head. And I was director of bioinformatics at Tiger, so I went to Claire Fraser, who was the president of Tiger at the time, and, and along with, uh, with Owen White and John Quackenbush, and we said, you know, it really would be better for us in the scientific community if we we're releasing all our software for free and making all open source. And she said, okay. And so um, over the weekend, um, I, since I was head of bioinformatics, I had the IT guys change all the licenses on our website, make everything open source. And the lawyer came in on Monday and discovered, uh, I think on Tuesday, that all the licenses had gone, the other restrictive licenses had all gone away and it was all open source. And, and he was quite um, disturbed about it, but he realized it was too late because it was already released and anybody who wanted it could have had it. So that was the end of that and we never went back. So, um, so one benefit of open source, besides the fact you no longer have to talk to lawyers, which in my view was a big benefit, um, is that it gets used. It's much easier for people to use it. They don't have to work on a license. 
So um, these are the citation counts from, from Google Scholar uh, for the Glimmer software over the years, and so those are citation counts as of a, a week or two ago. Um, and it's been cited uh, tremendously uh, uh, for us uh, a huge number of times, over 4,000 citations to the three papers. And that's what we wanted. So that's, um, that's for us the form of payment that we get. That's the reward we get. And, and so and on the flip side, by the way, if you're using someone else's software and it's open source, make sure you cite it in your papers because that's kind of the only rewards that we get. So that worked out very well for us. So uh, the next package we developed right around the same time, but just after that was, um, was a program called Mummer. So we, this is also open source. So Mummer was a program that we developed to align whole genomes to each other originally. Um, and so again, back in the late 90s, this was a novel concept. There wasn't any software that you could find that would let you align a whole bacterial genome to another whole bacterial genome. That was a, a huge task at the time. Uh, we were involved, the reason we developed it was that Tiger was sequencing a strain of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and uh, the Sanger Center was going to beat us to the punch. They were sequencing a different strain. It was going to be the first time, when our, when our genome was done, it was going to be the first time there were two genomes of the same species that had been sequenced. And so, of course, our paper was going to be about the comparison between them instead of just about that one species. So um, Rob Fleischman, who was leading the project, said, like, you know, I need to align these. So what can I use? And BLAST wouldn't do it. So, um, so we built this package originally for that and have used it for many other things um, since then and made it open source. Um, it's on SourceForge still. It's moving soon to GitHub, but it's on, on SourceForge today. It's currently in release three. Um, and it's been very popular as well. So we've published three papers over the years on Mummer and, and its successors, Mummer 2 and Mummer 3, uh, creatively named. And um, the Mummer, the name, by the way, comes from maximal unique matches, it uses a data structure called a suffix tree, which, so I'm not talking about the technical aspects, but um, it's very efficient. So it's been uh, very popular and very useful. And it's got over 3,300 citations over the years. And again, we appreciate that. That's the only sort of currency. That's the, the currency that we, that we work in is citations. And so we're happy that people are using the software and incorporating it into other packages. And um, um, even though it was first developed in 1998, this is still very actively used. A lot of citations are recent. Um, by the way, the main uh, usage, I think, today is for people who are comparing different assemblies uh, to one another. So we use it for that ourselves all the time. And so Mummer 4 is coming soon. Um, believe it or not, we'll have a new release, uh, and that'll be on GitHub. And that's a picture of a mummer. Um, so if you don't know, um, there's, a, there's a thing called the Mummers Parade every year in Philadelphia, and I think now it's in a few other cities too, where, where um, people dress up in these crazy colorful costumes, and I'm not sure exactly what the history of it is, but it has nothing to do with our software. But if you Google mummer, um, well, Google probably knows who you are, so it'll, it'll go to our software. But if you're not a bioinformaticist, it'll go to this, uh, to this group. So in more recent years, we've been developing, and Nomi mentioned this, we've been developing software for next generation sequencing data, um, starting in 2008 with a bow tie program, um, and followed uh, soon thereafter by top hat and cufflink. So these are programs for uh, doing uh, bow tie does alignment of, of reads to a genome and uh, very efficiently. And uh, Top Hat was designed soon after to align RNA-seq reads to a genome where you need to do a spliced alignment. And I'm, I have talks on these programs, but I'm not giving that talk today. Um, so these are uh, both efficient programs that will do the alignment and then the spliced alignment of your RNA-seq reads if you're doing RNA-seq. And Cufflinks does uh, assembly of the alignments into transcripts, and it also quantifies uh, the transcripts and does differential expression analysis too. So that's a, um, this is a very common set of tasks today, um, done by thousands of labs around the world uh, pretty much every day. And these programs have been phenomenally successful with over 20,000 citations just since they came out. Uh, and they've been open source since the beginning. Um, so, uh, and they were, I, uh, they, they were, they were developed by uh, Ben Langmead, uh, is the main developer of Bowtie and is actively, um, right now it's in Bowtie 2 and he's actively working on Bowtie 3. Um, Top Hat was developed by Cole Trapnell, another former student of mine. So Ben was a former student of mine. He's now an assistant professor at Hopkins. Uh, Cole Trapnell developed the first version of Top Hat, which was then um, redone and, and extended significantly by Daewon Kim, who developed Top Hat 2. And Cole also developed Cufflinks uh, and, and now works on single cell RNA sequencing as another program called Monocle. So, um, so all of my students also are developing everything in the open source model. When they were in my lab, they didn't have a choice, but I'm pleased to say that, that they're strong proponents of this too, and I expect they will continue developing in that, in that vein. 
Um, and, and bow tie alone is incorporated into something like 75 to 100 other packages that are using it. So one nice feature of open source software is if you're doing, so if your software does something useful and you don't put any restrictions on it, other people will not only use it, but they'll incorporate it in their packages and, and distribute them, um, which, uh, which is why we develop them. Um, so even more recently, we're developing, uh, I have to put in a plug for our recent development. So we have um, successors, we, we think there's, we designed these as successors to Top Hat and, and Cufflinks. So String Tie is a successor to Cufflinks that does transcript assembly and quantification uh, transcripts. And that's uh, the work of El Pratea, who's an assistant professor at Hopkins. And HiSat2 um, is a successor to Top Hat. It's quite a bit faster, uh, much faster, actually, on the order of 40 times faster than Top Hat. Um, it does splice alignment, and that's Daywan Kim's work, and Daywan is, is the guy who developed Top Hat too. So, um, so that's a kind of that's just a, just to mention, sort of put a plug for the software we're developing today. So, so open software um, doesn't put license in your way, and if you develop your software in this framework, and you're doing something, of course you have to develop good software and it has to be useful, um, but people will use it, and it's just much easier if you don't have to worry about licenses. So um, since they asked me to give a keynote talk, I thought I would, I would uh, also use this opportunity to complain a little bit. Um, so uh, not all software in the genomics world is open source. So this is my first entry on the closed source wall of shame um, is uh, GATK, which you're probably all familiar with. Uh, one of the most popular, if not the most popular systems for doing variant calling um, from next generation sequence data. Um, here's a GAT, part of a snapshot of the GATK website. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice package, it's, it, it's uh, an accurate caller. We've, we use it at Hopkins for a number of projects. And um, what is sort of surprising to me was that it was open source. The first version, I think the second version were open source. Uh, and, then they just, and then once it got very popular, they made it closed source. So the more recent releases are not open source. They're free to academics, but they're, the license is different. Um, so, um, I'm sure you all know the Broad Institute is probably the most uh, well-funded um, genomics institute in the, in the U.S. Um, and uh, so here's the paper describing GATK, um, published a few years ago in Genome Research. Um, and this, uh, you know, as, as is common with all papers, it cites the source of support. So it was supported by NHGRI, the Human Genome Research Institute at NIH, including a couple of, of, uh, of large grants that they mentioned there. And so I looked it up, and the large-scale genome sequencing grant that they mentioned um, was for $45 million in 2015 alone. So, so one thing I want to complain about is it's perfectly legal in the U.S. We have this, this thing called the Bayh-Dole Act that was passed way back in 1980 that says universities can commercialize the results of publicly funded work, so you're allowed to do this. That doesn't mean that it's, that it's right or okay. So I think if you're getting $45 million of my money, that's taxpayer money, um, to develop methods like this, then you should give them away for free. Um, if you want to go to a company and, and make money in your software, I'm totally supportive of that. I think it's great that there are companies, they, 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 they make the world go around. But if you're getting all your funding or most of your funding from public sources, then um, another argument for making your software open source is that's the right thing to do. So um, this is the license. So if you, if you now try to get GATK, you have to go and look at this license. Nobody reads these things. Um, but if you did read this thing, you discover they added this nice feature that I just wanted to mention. Some of you might know about this. Um, the current version of GATK has a phone home feature, um, which um, you don't see that in much open source software. So the phone home feature is a feature which um, you can read here. It says, um, un unless you request disablement, which means you read the license carefully, um, that the, um, the Broad Institute is going to collect information about your usage of the software uh, without you knowing about it, um, if you're using it. So. Um, uh, that, they could put that in even if it was open source, but I thought this was um, kind of annoying that they put that in there. All right, so that's my, um, my one complaint about open source software. So let me now talk about open data. In many ways, this is a bigger issue. Um, it affects not just um, software developers, but pretty much anyone doing science is collecting data. Um, genomics has um, a tradition of open, of open release of data, of, of sharing of data, more than uh, any other field of science, as far as I know, and it, it happened with um, it happened with the human genome. It's when it really got uh, the the incentive to, or the sort of model of releasing data freely, um, was created. So th these are you've probably all seen these covers. These are the covers of Science and Nature back in 2001 when the human genome was published. 
Um, just as a, a quick reminder, if there's younger people here who don't, uh, or aren't familiar with all the details, so Science published um, a genome paper about a version of the genome that was sequenced and uh, at a place called Solera Genomics. Um, Solera was a, a for-profit company that was a spin-off from, from Tiger, where I was, so I knew uh, all the people at Solera quite well, and I collaborated with them. They had many outside collaborators on, on that genome. And um, the Nature paper, which was published at the same time, was the result of the public um, international human genome uh, project, which had been going on since 1989. Uh, and they culminated in these two papers. Um, which were uh, published uh, more or less at the same time and uh, with joint press conferences and there was a big, uh, there was a big race going on. So, and the race was a very exciting thing and then since I was involved in it, I'll just uh, talk about it for a minute. Um, so the race went on from 1998 to 2001. There's a picture of Solera Genomics headquarters on the left. Solera Genomics was actually part of, uh, of a larger company, Applied Biosystems. And Solera is no longer uh, sort of really with us as an independent entity, but it was formed to sequence the human genome. That was kind of the reason the company was created. Um, people asked at the time, how are you going to make money on that? And uh, that question was never really sufficiently answered, and that's one reason why Solera is not with us anymore. Um, on the right is the, is the, the uh, second page of the, of the Nature paper on the genome showing the the sequencing centers and the, and the main contributors from those sequencing centers. The author list is not just that page, but many, many more authors that were listed in a supplement. So there were hundreds, if not thousands, of authors on that paper. Um, so there was this race going on starting in 1998, um, and it happened because Solera got, um, since it was owned by Applied Bios uh, Biosciences, um, they, they had just developed, um, they just developed this new capillary sequencer called the ABI 3700, which this will sound quaint maybe to those of you who, who um, are used to next-gen sequencing, but it was a big uh, advance in the speed and throughput of sequencing because it could do Sanger sequencing in capillaries rather than in big um, gel slabs. And so it, it allowed you to sequence much faster. And the, uh, the, the people behind Solera, including Craig Venter, said, well, we could, we could actually sequence the entire human genome uh, as a shotgun sequencing project. Um, with these machines. And so that's what they decided would be their first big project. And they announced that they were going to do that in 98, uh, and they were going to compete with the public effort, which had been kind of tootling along for um, about eight years at that point. Um, and, and everybody scrambled to figure out what to do, because Solera immediately announced that they were going to be finished in 2003. Um, the public group's goal was to do the genome in 15 years, starting in 1990 and finishing in 2005. Um, and so Solera said, oh, we're going to do it um, in five years. We'll be done in 2003. So Francis Collins quickly got the leaders of the public uh, on the U.S. side together. And they said, oh, we're going to be done in 2003 as well. And Craig uh, then said, no, we'll be done in 2002. And then Francis said, we'll be done in 2002 as well. And then Craig said, we'll be done in 2001. And the public effort, of course, said, we'll be done in 2001, which is at some point, some of the people doing the actual work must have talked to them and said, we can't actually get it done in the times you're talking about. So they stopped pushing the date forward, um, but um, it did get published in 2001. Um, the genome uh, wasn't really done in 2001. In fact, there's still gaps in the human genome today, um, but it was, uh, it was an exciting time. So the public effort was concerned because there's this company competing like, well, you know, how are they going to make money on this? So one way they could make money is they could patent human genes. And uh, there was definitely concern about that. Um, here's um, here's a plot showing human genome patent litigation, not patent application, but just litigation um, each year from 87 through June 2007. Um, and there were lawsuits about gene patents, and there were many hundreds of gene patents. Actually, in, in the end, thousands of human genes um, were patented over the course of about uh, 25 years. Um, you, you might also be aware that just a couple years ago in the U.S., the U.S. Supreme Court um, invalidated the patent to, patents to BRCA1 and BRCA2, the breast cancer genes. Uh, that had been the source of almost all the revenues for Myriad Genomics or Myriad Genetics uh, for many years. So um, many of us, including me, felt that human genes shouldn't be patented and shouldn't be allowed to be patented, but the courts were allowing it for decades. And that might, that, that day might be over, but certainly back in the late 90s, it was, it was a big concern that the genome that we're all working on would be locked up under patent, uh, under patents, and you wouldn't be able to work on, on these genes that we were sequencing without getting some license from someone. So therein le that led to the, uh, the open release, the open data policy of, the, of NHGRI. So NHGRI realized that if they released all the data right away, once data is in the public domain, you can't really patent it, or these, that, was the, that was the idea. So the, the publicly funded groups started releasing their data overnight. So they would sequence stuff, so they, would, they would be doing sequencing. It was mostly of backs at first, 
um, for many years, it was of backs, and they would put it at NCBI in the trace archive overnight, and the, that was to prevent Celera Genomics or others from patenting human genes. So that, that made everybody happy. So here's um, a picture of the president was happy. Um, Bill Clinton was the president. We might have another Clinton as president sometime soon, but anyway, Bill Clinton was president at the time, and there's um, Craig Venter sitting uh, to, on the left side of the screen and Francis Collins on the right side of the screen, um, also all looking very happy. Um, Craig and Francis aren't usually smiling at the same place at the same time very often, so this is a good picture. Um, so, um, so that's how we got to where, we, where things started, but what was interesting was that after the human genome was published, NHGRI had kind of already established this precedent, so a lot of, a lot of scientists and, and people at, uh, within NHGRI realized this seemed like a good thing. The public money is being spent to sequence genomes. The genomes ought to be shared. And so that policy has been in place at NHGRI for, um, ever since, that when you, when you get sequencing grants from them, generally speaking, you've been required to release the data even before publication. But this is not true of other fields, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so I just wanted to mention that sharing data, in addition to protecting, uh, to, to sort of making sure the data remains open and people don't patent it, um, you can produce, you can end up with unexpected discoveries when you release your data. So people can make discoveries on your data, and that's actually one reason why scientists don't want to release data is because someone might discover something and, and I could have made that discovery, I could have written that paper. But sometimes the discoveries uh, are something you wouldn't have thought of, so that's, uh, and that benefits the rest of us. So I'll just mention one example of something I was in, uh, a discovery that, that, that I made um, uh, because of open data. So there was this project back in the mid-2000s to sequence uh, 12 Drosophilus, very ambitious at the time. Today it would not be that ambitious, but very ambitious at the time in the mid-2000s because it was all Sanger sequencing. And Melanogaster had been sequenced by Celera Genomics as kind of a, the, what they called a warm-up to the human genome and published in 2000. But this project was sequencing 11 other Drosophilus. Here's a tree of those, of those fruit flies here, and it was depositing all the data in the trace archive because that was the policy of NHGRI. That was what you had to do. You put the data in the trace archive even before the, the genomes were published and other people could look at it. So I happen to know, um, because we were working on a Wolbachia genome at Tiger, that Wolbachia is a bacterial genome that is an endosymbiont of, of many invertebrates. Um, fruit flies have, have Wolbachia in them, not all fruit flies, not all species of Drosophila. Um, but it, it co-evolves with its host. So these are, um, these are uh, pretty small bacteria that live in, mostly in the eggs of fruit flies. Uh, and there's an image on the right which, which is stained to show this Wolbachia in, in the ovaries of, of the female fruit fly. And in fact, they co-evolve over the course of millions of years, and different Wolbachias live in different, fruit, different Drosophilus, and they, they're not that similar to each other. They diverge over time. So a um, so question arose. It's actually Mike Eisen asked this question, uh, made this comment to me, which was, well, you know, some of those other 11 Drosophilus, they probably have Wolbachias in them. And I thought, yeah, they do, and we're sequencing a Wolbachia from Melanogaster, and we have these raw reads from the other 11 Drosophila, so I can use the sequence of the known Wolbachia and see if there are other ones, uh, if they're similar enough. I'm um, using Mummer, by the way, to do that. Um, and yeah, there were. We found three new species of Wolbachias that the people doing the Drosophilus hadn't just hadn't been thinking about. Uh, and we collected all the reads and, and um, did the best we could to assemble them. We had a lot of reads from one of the species, not as many from the other two, uh, and published a paper on it back in 2005 and uh, included Mike as a co-author because he made the critical suggestion that got it started. So, um, so scientists, though, don't always want to share their data. In fact, uh, I've argued, and I think this is still true, that if the funders don't require it, Generally speaking, scientists will sit on their data and not share it. Um, there's another um, story I wanted to share with you. I was involved in a project, I was, well, actually was one of the founders of this project to do influenza sequencing along with David Lipman. Um, starting back in 2003, we had, a, we had funding from NIAID, the Allergy and Infectious Disease Institute at NIH, to sequence the flu virus. And this wasn't to sequence one flu virus. The flu virus is tiny. It's only 13.5 kilobases, uh, like many viruses, it's really small. So, you can sequence the flu virus basically, uh, you know, in a, in a few hours. Um, it's an RNA virus. That makes it a little trickier, so you have to do RT-PCR to turn in DNA, but never mind that. So this, the goal of this project was to get a picture of the flu virus as it's changing from, from year to year. So you probably all know that you have to get a flu vaccine every year. You're supposed to get a flu vaccine every year if you want uh, immunity from it. And that means the vaccine has to be redesigned every year, so we need to kind of keep track of how the flu is mutating. And the reason you need a vaccine every year is the flu mutates very, very fast. And generally speaking, last year's vaccine, or the one from the year before that, is probably no longer effective because the virus itself has changed too much. 
So, um, so uh, David Lippman pointed out to me that, well, we only had seven flu, flu virus um, genomes in GenBank back in 2003, and there was no reason for that with the technology we had. We could be sequencing hundreds of them per year, maybe thousands per year, and getting a much better picture of the virus as it evolves and changes in response to um, uh, uh, changes in the human immune system and also in the vaccination programs. Um, so we started this project. It's been very successful. Um, there's a graph. It's actually now it's still ongoing. It's, it's run at the, it was at Tiger, so it's, it's still uh, being run by the Venture Institute today. They're, they're just under 20,000 genomes now. So we did the first, uh, uh, the first 200 or so genomes were back in 2004, 2005, and that's the first paper we published on that, led by Elodie Geddon, who was at the time at Tiger, and she was leading the, the laboratory part of the project. Uh, but what I wanted to tell you is that when we, uh, a key part of this project was to go around. We were a sequencing center. We didn't have any flu viruses. So we contacted uh, uh, leading people in the influenza research community who had collections of, of isolates that they've been collecting and said, hey, we've got this funding uh, from NIAID. Many of them had funding from the same source. And we said, we, we, will, we would like to sequence as many isolates as, 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 as you think would be useful to sequence. And we will pay for it. In fact, NIAID will give you additional money to do the preparation of the RNA, and you just send us the RNA, and we'll take it from there. The only condition, the only condition is that um, once we sequence, within at most two months, it goes into GenBank, no restrictions. So the data is freely available. And to my surprise and disappointment, most of the leading flu labs said, no thanks, we don't want to do it. Because we, these are our isolates. I'm like, they're your isolates. You have public funding to collect them. Do you remember why you went into the research? I didn't actually ask them this, but I was thinking, why, did you, why are you doing research on the flu anyway? Isn't it to like, help treat the flu, perhaps design better vaccines for the flu? But they were thinking, no, I'm in this because I need papers about the flu. So they didn't want to release the data publicly. But fortunately, um, mostly thanks to David Lippman, we were able to, he was very persistent. He was able to find some people in the flu community who were not like that, who were willing to share their isolates and, and put them in the public domain quickly. And so the project took off. Um, and is, is, is very, has been very successful. But no thanks to the really senior, and I won't name them here, but some of the senior people in the flu community just didn't want to uh, play ball because we were insisting the data be open. So, um, so this is a, a letter we wrote, uh, some of us wrote on a slightly different issue. This is about um, human genome and other genomics data. So there's been a, a policy with various names on it. At the time we wrote this letter, it was called the Bermuda Policy about data release. Um, uh, that the NIH follows, and it, starting, it started at NHGRI, the Human Genome Institute. And this policy is the policy that says somewhere in it, like all data, that genome data should be, should be um, freely released so that the community will benefit from it. Um, and they updated the policy in 2003, and they said, um, I, don't, I don't remember, I, don't, I didn't write down the exact words that they used, but they said, well, um, the policy is it's that open, open sharing of data is to everyone's benefit, and this ought to happen, and data producers need to share their data in unrestricted form. Um, but then they said in the same policy, um, but then the data users, that would be people like, like me, um, need to respect the rights of the data producers to publish the first comprehensive analysis of their genome data, whatever that means. Um, so they had these sort of vague, what I would call weasel words in the policy that said, yeah, it's freely available, unrestricted, but no, actually it's not. And so, um, so I got together with, um, so I wrote this letter and then I convinced uh, Owen White, Ewan Bernie, and Sean Eddy to, to co-author it with me and write to, and we published it in, I think this is in Nature, um, saying unrestricted free access is unrestricted and your new policy, the new policy of, of the Human Genome Institute is not exactly unrestricted, so, um, so we weren't happy about that. And I should mention that, um, not that there's a cause and effect here, but all four of us eventually won this uh, award for open science, the Ben, ben Franklin Award. Um, and we've all been uh, strong advocates of, of free sharing of data uh, since that time or even earlier. So, so there are, even today, even funded by NHGRI, there's some big genomes. So I'm going to complain again. So I already complained about, open, about uh, sort of some bad players in open so source software. Let me talk about data projects that aren't, da uh, large data generation projects that aren't so good about sharing data. So even in the genomics community, which has this tradition uh, much more than other, other fields of sharing data, um, it's not always done so well. So I'm going to mention some projects that you probably all know about. So one is ENCODE. This is a, a large project, stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, a project that started at NHGRI back in 2003 as a pilot, uh, where it ran for three years as a pilot and then became like not a pilot. 
Um, I was involved in the pilot, so I want to disclose that. I was not funded. You could be an unfunded participant, but I was involved in the pilot. It's grown very rapidly since then. Um, NIH has invested tens of millions of dollars in it. Um, and it's a pretty much a data generation project where the idea is that we'll um, look at whatever methods there are for figuring out what are functional elements in the genome. We'll apply those methods kind of across the genome and just sort of see what comes out. So there's no hypotheses. It's just we'll generate a lot of data where we apply methods like let's look for, you know, um, DNA methylation or, or um, uh, DNA hypersensitivity sites or other things like that, and we'll apply these methods across the genome and generate results, and then maybe you can discover things from that. So it's been a big investment. So, for example, the Data, Coord the data Coordinating Center, the DCC for ENCODE, so that part of it alone received $13.5 million, which just basically to manage the data over the past four years. And there's many, many other projects to do the analysis of the data um, spread around uh, the U.S. So here's a map showing all the funded centers, which are remarkably concentrated along the, the, the coasts, as you see, in fact, remarkably concentrated in a fairly small number of places. So the money has been spread around, but not everybody is part of ENCODE. Um, and what I want to complain about is that it's basically a data generation project. There's no hypotheses. We're spending tens of millions, it might be hundreds of millions at this point, of, of NIH funds on it. And the data was, um, until fairly recently, I'll say on the next slide, was released, but it was embargoed. So you could look at it, but you couldn't publish any results on it until the data generation groups published their, uh, uh, published their results. So um, there was a lot of pressure from the non-funded people. Um, I guess it finally had an effect. So finally, in March 2014, they changed the policy. So it's now they're doing the right thing, but for the project started in 2003. So it took them about 10 years, but now the policy is what I've, what I've reproduced here, that the community, that's all of us, can now analyze and publish results on any ENCODE data without restrictions as soon as they are released, which is, I, I think is the only re true um, open data policy that NIH should, should be using. Um, and they just ask that you cite the ENCODE consortium when you use their data, which I would totally support. I mean, the whole point of uh, releasing data, of uh, you spending time generating data, the only reward that they get is citation. So of course you should cite them. Another project that has been not so good about data sharing, um, a more recent project, but it's uh, actually even more expensive from the point of view of NIH investment, is the GTEx project. Some of you might be involved in that. I have close colleagues who are uh, involved in it. Um, this is a, a project to do RNA-seq on um, basically all human tissues, dozens of different tissue types in hundreds of people. So we're talking uh, on the order of 15 to 16,000. Uh, RNA-seq experiments was the initial plan. They've expanded that beyond that now. So it's a huge number of RNA-seq data sets. Um, and this is just something I got off the NIH funding site. So the current funding for the Data Coordination Center is $34 million. That's not for one year. It's over a four-year period, I believe. So we're spending a lot of money just to manage the data that's being generated. And again, this is a data generation project. There's no hypothesis. It's just like, well, we can do this thing called RNA-seq. We can measure gene expression in human tissues. Let's measure gene expression in all human tissues on a lot of people, and then we can get a great picture of what genes are expressed in different tissues for humans. I think that's a great idea, but the data should be shared to everybody. Anybody who could make any discoveries from that ought to have, um, ought to have access to it. Unfortunately, the GTEx data release policy was not that. Um, the, the V3 data, I didn't look back at the V1 and V2 data. On their third version of the data, they said that secondary users, that would be any of you if you're not one of them, so you're secondary, are asked to refrain from, from submitting manuscripts describing comprehensive analyses until the consortium has published their analysis. Um, so this caused multi-year delays. So the project was running for several years bef before they published their analyses. And of course, many people just didn't bother to analyze data, because why would you? Why would you analyze data when you know that you can't publish on it, the journals aren't going to let you, the data producers aren't going to let you, and you don't really know what the data producers are doing, so you're just going to um, uh, get scooped, probably. Um, in their version four of the data, they, they modified that a little bit. They said there would be a nine-month publication restriction um, starting from the date of, the, of release. And then finally, the current policy uh, uh, today, which was V5 data, um, was changed just last year. They finally lifted those restrictions. Um, the papers, the main papers describing the GTEx data appeared in, in May 2015. So basically, they restricted release of the, they restricted the use of the data until they were ready to publish their papers. Um, so now there's no restrictions on the use of GTEx data, but they should have been doing that from the beginning. And if I'd been at NIH, I would have been, if I'd been setting this policy, I would have said, look, to the people getting these grants, I would have said, we're going to give you this, if you want to get $34 million to manage the data, then there's not going to be any restrictions on it. And I have no doubt that people would be happy to generate the data under those terms, but you have to tell them up front. 
And if you ask them, do they want to release the data and you didn't require it, they're going to say, no, actually, we'd rather we write our papers first and then release the data. And that's what happens uh, time and time again. So just to be realistic, though, human data can be harder to share. Um, GTEx is human data, so there's, there might be, there are reasonable restrictions to place on data when it involves human subjects. Uh, in fact, we need to, to be careful about how we release human subjects data. So this doesn't apply so much to, say, Drosophila data, but to, to human data because you have data from, um, from people um, who might uh, be concerned about um, their genetic information getting out there. You have to, you have to respect that. So here's, um, so the International Cancer Genome Consortium has huge, is collecting a huge amount of, of data from, from different types of tumors. Um, there's actually more than one such cancer project, but this is one of the biggest ones. Um, and, and their statement about data release is that um, a guiding principle is to maximize benefit of the public. Um, they, so the guiding principles, they want to maximize benefit of the public, but protect the interest of, of the sample donors and their relatives, and, and I would agree with that. So when it comes to data, this is uh, what they said about that, that data, data producers have responsibility to share data, to release data rapidly and publish their global analysis in a timely manner. Um, but then they added this, this clause of equal importance is responsible use of the data by end users. That would be the secondary users again, uh, which is defined as allowing the data producers the opportunity to publish the gl initial global analysis of the data within a reasonable period of time. So there's the same phrase that the uh, Human Genome Research Institute was using back in the early 2000s that um, Sean Eddy and Owen White uh, and, and you and Bernie and I wrote a letter about, which is this, this, these, what I would call weasel words, allowing the data producers the opportunity to publish the initial global analysis of the data within a reasonable period of time. So there's no definition of what a reasonable period of time is. Is that a year? Is that five years? And I, I've been in, involved in, in projects and looked at other uh, people's data where it has been five years. So, um, so it's a big loophole. So I think it's, um, uh, it, when you're doing, when you're funding a big data generation project, you need to think carefully about, uh, the funders need to think carefully about how they're going to, uh, what they're going to require of the, of the data producers. And I don't think they would have any problem getting people to, um, to release genome data with no restrictions if they just put that condition on in the front. So, um, and, uh, and sort of a timely example along these lines is, uh, you, you, many of you probably know that Joe Biden um, announced um, this, what he called the cancer moonshot, uh, or Obama called it a cancer moonshot in his State of the Union address earlier this year. And Joe Biden is leading that effort because, um, tragically, his son died of brain cancer um, uh, fairly young, just, uh, just a year or two ago. So Biden just, just um, a few weeks ago announced the, the launch of a major open access database to advance cancer research. So we'll see how this works out. Cancer researchers um, are not used to sharing their data with other people either. Um, so we'll see if it works out. I hope it does because I think this will help science move faster. That's, the, uh, that's certainly the goal of the people who are funding the research and that's the goal of all the patients who are supporting it. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll just sort of, well, let me just mention this very quickly. So there's also, there's, there's other initiatives like this. This is um, the, the Alzheimer's disease, uh, there's an Alzheimer's disease imaging initiative that's been doing this for several years. Um, they announced a couple years ago that they were um, um, launching a global effort to use innovative open science techniques to, to improve diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's. And this again involves, this similarly involves sharing data, in this case mostly imaging data, um, but also some sequence data. And because it's, it's human data, there, there's some policies, I didn't mean for you to be able to read this, but there's, there's a fairly complicated data access um, policy, but it's reasonable. They basically, you need to show that you are someone who has a serious scientific interest in the data and you're not just going to release it publicly because the patients haven't consented to that. But it, they do want to share the data with any science, scientist who sort of has a legitimate um, reason for wanting to see it and who might help uh, understand the disease. Um, also, one last thing about open data is that it also it helps correct bad science. Now, this is actually a reason why data producers may not want to share data is that you might find mistakes in what they do. But in the interest of, of science, it's better to have data be open. And now I'll just mention one uh, very recent um, result that was, I thought, very interesting. Um, so there was a genome published just uh, last winter of uh, this very cute microscopic animal called a tardigrade. There's a picture of it. You can't see it. It's uh, microscopic, but it's an animal. Um, and um, the tardigrade genome was published with um, a very surprising result, which was, um, here's the title of the paper, Evidence for Extensive Horizontal Gene Transfer from the Draft Genome. All the data was publicly available. Um, the reads were available. The, uh, the, the assemblies were available. Um, at, I'm not sure how far in advance, but certainly when the paper came out, it was all available. And so they claimed that about a sixth of the genome 
was from other species, had been uh, horizontally transferred into the genome of this uh, animal, which was uh, far and away the most foreign DNA in any, any organism um, ever, ever sequenced. Um, but it seemed implausible to many people and uh, especially implausible to a group that happened to be sequencing, uh, a group uh, um, uh, led by Mark Blackstreet happened to be sequencing the same organism and um, they didn't have any of this foreign DNA in their assembly. It was all contamination. Um, and so uh, just a few months later, they published a paper in PNAS. They're both in PNAS, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And you can see the two titles are remarkably similar. So the second title basically says the first title with the word no in front of it. So, um, so that, that was a great example where they, they took the data that was available and they reanalyzed and said, look, we have different data, but we can look at their data, we can look at our data, we, we can demonstrate that, in fact, those things that they thought were horizontally transferred were just contaminants. So open data is terrific. It makes science move faster, it make, and it helps science correct itself. Um, but just to, in trying to be fair, I want to mention that, that, that there are, uh, there is a downside to sharing data. Here's a, a blog that just appeared uh, about a month ago from a scientist in a different field who had collected a, a huge database uh, of images. Um, uh, this is an, 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 an ecologist. And, and she wrote on her blog that if you publish a data set, she released this big data set, and she wrote uh, her experience was if you publish a data set, you pretty much lose control of the, over authorship. And she made the point that if she hadn't released the data for free, then anybody who wanted to write papers about it or analyze it would have to ask her for it, and maybe she would get some co-authorships out of that. Um, but, and this is, a, this is an ongoing debate, and, there's, and, and I can't argue that that's not true. Uh, but science, so science may benefit, but um, individual scientists may not always benefit from releasing their data. So, um, so that's just something to think about. So let me, the last, my last topic, just for the last um, 10 minutes here, I'm going to talk about uh, five or 10 minutes about um, open publishing, open access publication. So this is a, a, another way in which um, I think science should be done in the open, is that when we publish our papers, um, it's better for the, for the sake of science if we publish it in open access journals. So open access, by the way, means that um, when, you, uh, when you publish your paper, anyone can read it um, without having to pay a subscription fee to the journal where it's being published, and they can share it with others, they can distribute it, they can distribute it to others. Um, it also generally means that you own the rights to it, that the journal doesn't own the rights to it. But it doesn't have to mean that, but it, it does mean that everybody has access to the papers. So it, it sort of makes sense. We write the papers, we review the papers in scientific journals, um, the public, in general, pays for the vast majority of papers that appear in scientific journals. Um, and so it's kind of weird. You think, well, then who would own the papers? In this model, if you just sort of, without knowing anything about academic publishing, if you, if you wanted to know who do you think owns the papers, you would be surprised to hear that, that a private publishing company like Elsevier owns the papers. It wouldn't make any sense. So uh, the way that came to be is that about 200 years ago, when journal publication started, the journals had these things called printing presses, and they would actually print paper copies of everything, and they had trucks that they would send copies of the journals around to. And that was, as a scientist, that was how you distributed your work. And so the journals were doing a great service to scientists because we didn't have good ways of communicating our results back in the 1800s, maybe early 1900s. Uh, and so we needed to publish them in these, uh, uh, in these print journals, and it was expensive to produce those journals. So the journals owned this thing called copyright, which means, and you know, there were no Xerox copiers or anything back in the 1800s. So any, no one else could make copies of them, only the journals could. And so you were, um, they, were they were paying for all of that uh, infrastructure to do printing and distribution of print copies. Uh, so in return, the scientists had to sign over copyright to the journals. We still do it today. So that pretty much hasn't changed, um, the signing over of the copyright today, um, if you're not publishing in open access journals. But what has changed is that we don't need the journals to distribute our work anymore. And that's been true only for about 20 years. The internet really didn't catch on until the early 90s. And online journals just started appearing in the mid 90s. So it's been about 20 years now that we've been doing this experiment. It's, it's become sort of standard now that we read all our, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't print out papers. I read all my papers on my computer. I get everything from journal websites. I don't look at hard copies of journals. I'm uh, pretty sure that everybody I work with does the same. So we don't need those printing presses and those trucks that carry around journals anymore. Um, the journal publishers don't want to change things, though. They are very profitable. So they don't want to make everything free and open access, because then people wouldn't subscribe to the journals. So if you're at a university, your university library is probably paying huge amounts of money and subscription fees to these, to these publishers to have access to those journals. 
And if you're reading them from your in, inside your university, um, inside the firewall, you don't see any, fire, any paywalls because the university has already paid subscriptions. But if you're not there, um, you would. You'd have to pay for every copy of a paper. It's not open access. So um, NIH passed an open access policy here in the U.S. Um, finally, after years of effort in 2009, um, that requires uh, anybody funded by NIH, here's the policy, to submit your manuscript to something called PubMed Central, where everything is freely available, no later than 12 months after the official date of publication. So you can, you can always publish today. There are many open access journals, and I would encourage you all to publish in those journals, in which case things are immediately available. Um, because the question is, well, why wait 12 months? So the reason why is that the publishers lobbied for that to happen. So the original idea that, um, and by the way, this came from uh, the impetus for this open access policy, um, we should be a little ashamed, it did not come from scientists, it came from patients. And that's why it went through NIH and not in the US, not through NSF. Patients starting in the early 2000s, late 90s, 2000s, when, you, when people got sick, they would go and try to read about what was making them sick. And they quickly discovered that all this work that they had paid for, um, they couldn't read it without paying $25, $35 for each article. And most of the times, the articles wouldn't be understandable or useful to them. They just wanted to take a look. So patients got upset about this and started lobbying to make that research freely available. And they're the ones who actually made this happen um, and got Congress to pass this requirement that NIH work, at least, would be, would be open access. Um, so here's an announcement from, so here's something back in 2005. The draft version of this open access policy was initially issued in 2004. Um, and that was going to have a six-month delay. Um, and the publishers lobbied against it. We were probably all oblivious to that. And, and here's a press release from January 2005 saying the open access announcement was scuttled. So the publishers succeeded in, in delaying it. And I just canceled this conference where they were about to announce this policy with a six-month delay. And then they changed it to a 12-month delay. Um, academic libraries wrote this open letter to the head of NIH at the time, Elias Sirhuni, saying, why are you making a 12-month delay? You know, why is, why, this is back in 2005. Here, they said, we believe delays of 12 months um, um, serve neither the interests of science nor the public, and, and I would uh, agree with that. Um, the publishers continue to fight it. Um, here's something from 2008, very quickly. It was introduced, a bill was introduced in the House called Fair Copyright and Research Works Act. Um, which was going to shut down the open access policy. And by the way, if you live near Washington like I do and you follow the politics in the Washington Post, you learn that the names of bills that are introduced in Congress have nothing to do with what's in the bill, but they always sound like something everybody would love. So fair copyright and research, that sounds like a good thing, right? No, it was going to get rid of open access, what it was trying to do, but that was fortunately um, shot down. Um, they continue to fight it. So, so, by the, so, so that 2004 policy was eventually made policy in 2009. So they delayed it to 2009, got it to be a 12-month 12 um, uh, delay um, before things were required to be open access. And they're continuing to try to find other creative new ways. Just a few weeks ago, Mike Eisen um, blogged about um, a new trick that Elsevier came up with, which was um, so for-profit publishers nowadays, if you publish with them, they're not open access, but you can pay an extra fee to have your paper be open access. So if you do publish in one of those journals, um, then you can pay them some more money and then your paper will be immediately available. So Elsevier does this, but um, someone pointed out and then told Mike and he wrote about that, that the, uh, the license that they, that they um, let you pay extra money for wasn't true open access. It was something that he called an Elsevier access where um, Elsevier and not the authors retain all the rights that are not granted by the license. So it does make it, it does make it publicly available right away, but you don't have the real copyrights to the, to the work that you did. So, so, uh, so open access is certainly, as scientists, um, I think all of us want our papers to be read by as many people. We write them so people will read them, right? So we want everybody to read them. Um, it's not in my, I don't really care that much how much profit Elsevier makes. I don't want publishers to go away. Um, but if the for-profit publishers went away, we would find other ways to publish our work. We don't really need them the way we used to need them. So, um, so I think this is something, this is a fight that we're going to win, um, but publishers are struggling um, to keep things exactly the way they've always been because they're protecting their profits. So uh, in, a, in an article about this topic a couple years ago, John Walensky at Stanford University wrote, I can only advise constant, if not increased, vigilance on behalf of those with an interest in, op in openness of science because there are forces who are working against it. So, um, so my comment would be sort of overall, so just to, in conclusion, um, that uh, whether it's publication or data or software, um, science that kept, that's kept secret is no different from science that was never done. The reason we're in the field, and I 
encourage you if you're, and I try to remind myself on a regular basis, think about why am I doing this in the first place? Sometimes in the middle of working on a particular project, you kind of get carried away with your immediate goals, but you should step back now and then and think about, okay, I'm a scientist, what does that mean? That means that I'm doing research to try to understand some problems, solve some problems, and I want to communicate that to others so they can also make progress on those same problems, because I think those problems are problems that are important in some way. Um, and if you don't communicate your work, then things just take longer um, and, are, and progress is slower. So open science is, is the best way to move, move your field along, to, move, all, to move, move progress in all areas around. So you can choose to operate in a world like I've sort of illustrated with this, this uh, street, sign, street closed sign on the left where you have to have licenses for all the software, where data is private and you have to get permissions to use it, and where publications are limited only to those who can pay subscriptions. Or you can work in a world where everything is shared. And I, I hope I've been clear that there are some downsides to sharing everything. That is, you could get scooped. That's the main downside. As a scientist, if you release everything, then someone else might make a discovery that uh, maybe you would have made, and they might do it before you. So um, that's a risk, but I think it's clear to me that, that, that the public benefits and the scientific fields the scientific field benefits if everything is done in the open. And it encourages people, if you're working in this model, then you have to move a little faster. And I think that's, that's good for us as well as good for, for our competitors. So I'll conclude with that. And I just want to thank to all of my students and former students and, and collaborators who all also support um, these models that I've been discussing today. And I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you.